I heard a story on the radio some time ago. Actually, it was on a podcast. It comes through my radio, so I think of it as the radio. But it was about a Chinese-American journalist, and she was telling the story of her family. And her story has recently been made into a movie and, and got pretty good reviews and, and some popularity. Uh, but the story is about her grandmother who was still living in China. And her grandmother was diagnosed with cancer uh, and not given a very favorable prognosis. They did not expect her to live for a very long time. Uh, but the key to the story is nobody wanted to tell the grandmother, including the doctors. Didn't tell her. And instead, what they did was they staged a sort of pretend wedding for one of this journalist's cousins so that everybody, all of the extended family members, including people from, who had moved to different countries, could come back and have a big family event where they could all say goodbye to their grandmother and their grandmother not even realize that it was really a farewell party for her. Sometimes, I think we do the same thing in a bad way, in that we're afraid to talk about what is just under the surface. And we don't want to tell people the truth of what we know about the future and about what's going to happen. We call it sometimes the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, of course, is this thing that is there, that doesn't belong, that, that should, is causing everybody fear or anxiety, but nobody wants to talk about. We do that with hell. We like to ignore the fact that the future of most of the earth is eternal hell. One of Jesus' favorite criticisms, in fact, the one that's recorded more than any other, is Jesus saying, do not fear. Why are you afraid? Do not worry about your life, what you will wear, what you will eat and drink. Jesus said it over and over, do not fear. But there's one time where Jesus says to be afraid. And it's right here in Matthew chapter 10. Verse 28, and he says, do not fear here too. He says, do not fear those who are able to kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I don't want to manipulate you. I don't want to put a guilt trip on you. I don't want to scare you in some unfair way. But I want you to know that in the book of Matthew alone, just in the gospel of Matthew, at least, and it's really more than this, ten different times Jesus refers to eternal punishment in hell to make his point. One of which is here in Matthew chapter 10. But you also go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. He talks about the fiery hell. You'll be in danger or, or deserving of the fiery hell. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, he talks about eternal destruction. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, he calls hell outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Four different times he talks about outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, in the parable of the tares. He talks about the tares being burned up, and he says the same thing will happen to people, and they'll be thrown into a furnace of fire. Matthew chapter 13, verse 50, talking about the dragnet, the parable of the dragnet. He again talks about the furnace of fire, not for the garbage pulled out of the net, but for people. Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant, 
turned over to torturers. Matthew chapter 22, parable of the marriage feast, outer darkness, the one who didn't have the right clothes, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 23, verse 33, he asked the Pharisees, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Matthew 25, verse 30, the parable of the talents, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you see that Jesus refers to hell, to torment, to punishment over and over again? And that's just in one gospel. We could go a lot further if we went through the other gospels. The fact of the matter is that a powerful motivator that God intends for us is the prospect of the wrath of God for eternity. I had a little lady say to me just this week, she, she's a client of mine and she's telling a joke, and she asked me if I did criminal defense. And I told her, no, I don't do criminal defense. And she says, well, if you did, I was going to go out and rob a bank. I don't have any desire to rob a bank. And it's not because of the prospect of jail. If if the dictator of the world gave me a piece of paper and he said, this is a get-out-of-jail-free card for any crime, I still would not rob a bank. I don't need the threat of prison to keep me from robbing a bank. I would much rather live in poverty than be a thief or a robber. But sometimes, on certain situations, and probably especially when we're young, that threat of punishment is a powerful motivator. And it keeps a lot of people from doing a lot of bad things. And for me, with an eternal perspective, if I thought that I ceased to exist at my death, if I thought that I would have no consciousness and I would experience nothing after I died, I would probably make a lot of choices differently than I do now. And I think Jesus understands that, and that's why he talks about it over and over again. I want to look at a few passages and talk about the motivations that Jesus teaches in some of his references to hell. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29... He gives us a perspective on temptation and how we should look at the temptation to sin. And if you are tempted to sin, how you should react to it. And it's interesting that what he says here in Matthew chapter 5 is repeated in a little bit different words but with the exact same ideas in Matthew chapter 18. He says it twice just in the book of Matthew. But in Matthew 5 verse 29, Jesus says, If your right eye makes you stumble... Tear it out and throw it from you. Why? For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You get the point? Oh, you don't? Well, let me tell you. Let me look verse 30. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. He says the same thing about the eye again in Matthew chapter 18. You see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, if there is something in your body, if there is something inside of you that is going to result in your being lost for eternity, you're much better off maimed. You're much better off lame or crippled or blind than spending eternity in hell. And there's no priority that should ever take precedence over that. There's nothing in your life, no experience you will ever have is worth risking spending eternity in hell. It's a priority thing. Jesus says, if you really understood what eternal life is going to be like for the damned, you would live really different. He says, the way you look at sin The way you look at temptation should be different because of the prospect of hell. You go forward 
or actually uh, go back just a little bit in chapter 5 to verse 21. Jesus says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Jesus is saying, Monitor the way you treat other people. Consider carefully your attitude toward other people. What right, what position do you have to condemn other people? To call people a fool. To call people an idiot. To cast people down as useless or worthless. You are not God. You do not decide the value of other people. And putting yourself in that position puts you at risk of fiery hell. That's what he's saying. Why you shouldn't do that is because of the risk of punishment, of setting yourself up like God. How you treat other people should be changed by this fear. This one thing we're supposed to be afraid of. And that's people in the church. It's your brothers and sisters. Go to Matthew chapter 25. We talked about the parable of the talents very briefly, Matthew 25. But if you come further down in the in the chapter, then you see Jesus' prophecy about Judgment Day. And you remember, Jesus says all of the nations of the earth will be gathered together in one place and He'll divide them into two groups, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And He'll say to those on the right, Come, you blessed of my Father, and hear the kingdom of the world prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me to drink, I was sick and you came to visit me, I was in prison and you came to me. Well, then he turns to those on his left. Verse 41 says, Then he will say, then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. In Matthew 25, Jesus says that judgment itself is going to have a big dose of how you treated people in need. How you treated, how you responded to the people in your path who needed help. The way you respond to them is going to have a major impact on whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell. And that prospect of going to hell should be a powerful motivator to how you respond today. Right? That's how he's using this warning. That's how he's using this fear to change how we look at each other and how we treat each other because there's so much at stake. It doesn't really make any sense to talk about these things unless we look at the details, unless we look at the specifics of the descriptions of hell. If we don't appreciate the horror, the terror, that this type of punishment brings to people, then we won't respond the way we should. Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, the word hell there is the word Gehenna. It's translated from the Greek word Gehenna, which is a Greek version of the Hebrew word of Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom, which goes back to the Old Testament. But in Jesus' day, Gehenna was the garbage dump. And it was not very far from Jerusalem. It was not very far from the temple. 
but it's this big ravine, this really deep ditch. And it's pretty close to where everybody lives. But you can go there and you can throw things into that ditch. And there's people keeping fires going there. Uh, if you slaughter an animal and eat the meat and you want to throw the rest of it away, you take it there and you throw it away. Birds, vermin, vultures, all kinds of, of scavenger animals are there. And it's continually burning. And so it's the most disgusting place you can think of. This past week, we had some roofing torn off of a little outbuilding at our house, and we carried the roofing to the Bradley County dump because the dump in Hamilton County won't accept hardly anything, but you can dump regular trash in Bradley County, and it's not very far from our house. So we go up there, but while we're there, there's about four garbage trucks of just household trash that are coming and being dumped out right beside us. And there's these huge birds just flying down, all, and it's, it stinks, and it gets on your shoes, and you get back in your car, and you start to drive away, and you smell it for miles. It's horrible. Well, our landfills of today are a million miles better than what they were 50 years ago. And the landfills of 50 years ago, when they already had bulldozers to cover stuff up, were a million miles ahead of they were where they were 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus uses this place of horror, of stench, of dread, to picture hell, to tell us how bad it really is. Matthew chapter 13, in the parable of the tares, um, he's given the application of the parable of the tares in verse 40. He says, Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's sometimes Jesus says Gehenna, and other times He uses a, just a description and not a proper name, furnace of fire. Gehenna included fire, but included a lot of other stuff. And this is furnace of fire. You think about Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man wears purple and eats great food and has a big house and lives a life of luxury his entire life. Lazarus is a poor beggar, sick, covered in sores. They both die. Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man goes to hell, goes to torment. It's not named. It's just named Hades. It's just a, a generic term for the afterlife in Luke chapter 16. But the rich man calls out to Abraham. You remember what he says. He says, I'm in agony in this flame. Also, last week, we burned a brush pile at our house. And inside this brush pile was this blown down tree. When we moved to our house, there was this huge pine tree that was about this big around that had fallen over and the, the root ball had just come up out of the ground. And before we moved there, it had been cut off, but the trunk still stuck out about 10 feet and it was about this high off the ground. And so we've been burning it over time. And finally, last week, we burned it again and it, the stump finally burned all the way down to the ground. But it burned for three days. We come home the next day, it's still smoking, still burning. Get up the next morning, still smoking. Still Three days it burned. And when it was burning hot, bad, you couldn't get, couldn't get from here to Paul from it. It was so hot. It just it would scald your face. Today, right now, this morning, the rich man is still in agony in that flame. He's still in agony, and not three days, 2,000 years, who knows how long. Have you ever sat around a campfire or any kind of roasting weenie fire, maybe even your, your grill at home, and the wind turns and the smoke starts to blow in your face, 
and you have to get up and you have to move. And if you try to sit there in that smoke, you'll start coughing and you can't see and it'll get in your eyes. And you can't do it for more than a few seconds because the smoke is so overwhelming. Revelation chapter 9, verse 2 says, He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Hell is a smoking bottomless pit. An abyss of darkness and smoke. We can't take smoke in our face for more than a few seconds. The rich man has been in that smoke for thousands of years. And so will be everybody who ends this life outside of Christ. Another picture of hell is a volcano. Also in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You ever seen photographs of a volcano eruption where there's just this, this mass of lava, maybe a hundred yards wide, and it's just flowing down this hill? And it's, it just burns everything, in, it melts the rocks, it melts everything in its path, burns everything, it's a lake. That's a picture of a lake of fire. Brimstone occurs, it appears, in volcanic areas usually on the side of a volcano. It's a sulfuric rock. And when it gets really hot, it gets like molten lava, and it'll run downhill, and it'll smoke with this noxious odor. You know how bad sulfur smells? We'll take a sulfuric rock and heat it up until it's almost liquid, and think of how it smells. That's brimstone. Revelation says hell is like that. It's like a volcano that stinks. And it burns. Torment. Brothers and sisters, this is what everybody needs to know. I was listening to a Bible study podcast, and the preacher on this podcast is telling a story about a friend of his who was asked a question. And the question to his friend was, they said to him, now you're a Christian, so you believe that people of other religions, Muslims and Buddhists, that they're all going to hell. And the preacher on this podcast says, now what I would have said is I would have started talking about resurrection, and I would have said, well, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus was resurrected, and therefore I believe that all of Jesus' followers will be resurrected. Well, I'll tell you something. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The answer is yes. Anybody outside of Christ will spend eternity in hell. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 says, When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, if I have cancer, I want you to tell me. If my life likely only has a few months more on this earth, I want to know. And if I'm going to spend eternity in hell and there is an option to avoid that outcome, I want you to tell me that too. And I think Jesus teaches us that we owe that same obligation to everybody else. If you do not know God, if you do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
you will spend eternity in hell away from the presence of the Lord because no one comes to the Father except through Christ. It's the only path for any of us. And what you're talking about here, what we're dealing with here, is the divine punishment from God. If you remember there in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus says these will go away into eternal destruction. He says, prepare for the devil and his angels. The devil, Satan himself and his followers, have set themselves up in opposition to the God of heaven. They have set themselves up to be the opponents and chosen specifically and intentionally to be the enemies of of the God of heaven and earth, the God of all mercies, the God from whom all blessings flow. They have said, we're going to be His enemies. And when you put yourself against the God of heaven and earth, God designs a punishment. God designs a place of wrath. And that place of wrath is withheld from all of God's blessings. And the people who reject Christ are putting themselves in league with God's sworn enemy. And they will endure the same punishment prepared for God's sworn enemy. And as good as God is and as good as heaven will be, hell is just as bad. And that's why He warns us. And that's why Jesus says over and over again, be aware of how bad it is to experience the wrath of God. It should motivate you. It should make you look at your life differently. It should make you look at your position before God differently. It should make you look at your brothers and sisters in Christ differently. It should change how you treat everybody that you see, especially those who are in need. Because you don't have to experience that future. You don't have to be a part of of that punishment and that wrath. Jesus releases you from it. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful blessing when you understand the horrors of hell. Are you in Christ Jesus? Do you enjoy the freedom from condemnation that He provides? I hope you do. If you don't, I hope you change. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, putting your faith in Him, confessing that faith in front of people, repenting of your sins, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin, or if you need to return to Christ, if you need to make right what you've done wrong, please come down front as we stand and sing.